I just wanted to give a little bit more time for those that might be encountering technical difficulties with the registration process before we get started today for the Traffic Lawyers of Texas Summer Ethics Webinar. This is a bit of new ground for all of us and we appreciate the grace being extended to everyone that is participating uh, remotely in this presentation. We're going to wait an additional eh, three or four minutes. It's by my clock, it's a little bit after 10 a.m. right now on Saturday, August 15th, 2020. Again, we will wait for a few more minutes to allow stragglers to be able to access the seminar, the live presentation is today. This presentation is also being recorded and will be available on demand and will still allow you to receive two hours of ethics, continuing legal education credit. We will go through all of the details. I'll be expressing all of the details for how the reporting will happen. And again, we appreciate your patience. We're gonna wait an additional two minutes and then we will get started. We're very excited for the presentations today from our panelists. And I'll be introducing them as well as some additional housekeeping measures. I'm gonna wait one more minute before we get started. And again, thank you for your grace and your patience as we allow the technical issues to be worked out for those that have registered either this morning or right now so that you can participate fully in this presentation. It is now time for us to get started. Let me introduce myself. My name is Justin Holt. I am the 2020-2021 president of the Traffic Lawyers uh, Texas Bar Association, the only statewide organization focused on the unique issues encountered by practitioners in defense of Class C misdemeanor allegations in justice, municipal and county courts. Traffic Lawyers of Texas has been providing continuing legal education seminars for more than 28 years, and we are pleased for you to participate virtually for the very first time due to the unique challenges we are all experiencing due to the novel coronavirus. This CLE is being recorded and will be made available on demand in the coming weeks for those participants that could not join us today for the live broadcast. The CLE course number for the live broadcast will be provided to you via email to the address you provided at registration at the conclusion of this webinar. If you do not receive the required information to self-report your participation in the CLE, please email me at trafficlawyersoftexasonline at gmail.com. Again, that email address, all spelled out, no abbreviations, trafficlawyersoftexasonline at gmail.com. If you are participating in the CLE on demand, upon completion of the CLE, you will receive instructions again via email to the address you provided at registration for self-reporting your CLE credit. Your registration fees today include this two-hour ethics online webinar, as well as access to the in-person conference with an additional six hours of continuing legal education to be presented in Austin, Texas we hope in the first part of January, 2021. And it will also include uh, a listing in the Traffic Lawyers of Texas online directory. Additional details and information for the January, 2021 CLE in Austin 
will be sent to the email address you provided at registration. We will also make that information available at our website, which is trafficlawyersoftexas.org, O-R-G, all spelled out, no abbreviations, trafficlawyersoftexas.org, or on our Facebook page. If you are not already following us on Facebook, I would encourage you to go log into Facebook, search for Traffic Lawyers of Texas, and follow us so that you can have the latest updates. The board has decided to institute an update for the Traffic Lawyers of Texas online directory to better reflect our active membership and improve the resources available to our membership by inclusion in the online directory. Additional information regarding the directory update will also be sent to the email address you provided at registration. Today's CLE will consist of two presentations of approximately one hour each, with time allotted for a moderated question and answer period for live participants. If you have a question for any of our presenters, please use the Zoom question and answer button, which should be at the bottom of your screen, any time during the presentation to submit your question. I will do my best to address all questions and present those questions during the Q&A period to our panelists. Our first speaker today will be Mr. Robert Bennett. Bob Bennett has been providing guidance and support for lawyers and other licensed professionals involved in the dis disciplinary process for nearly 40 years. Bob will help us all better understand the resources available from the State Bar of Texas Lawyers Assistance Program. Mr. Bennett, the time is yours. I'm unmuted now, and so um, I see I'm on, but I don't see the program. So if we can have just that program show up, let me see if we can get that uh, going here. And I thought that we had the program, but it's not showing right now. So we're off to a uh, quick start. Um, Cynthia, can somebody help me just start that program or touch base with me or let me know what's going on? Um, we have, I know, 24 participants who are uh, waiting. Uh, Bob, we show yes. that the PowerPoint is on the screen. Okay, I can't see it though. That's, I guess that's the problem that I'm having with my screen. And um, I'll try that. I have different windows open, but it's not the... Um, It looks like we lost Bob <laughs> temporarily, hopefully. Um, let's give him a minute to get logged back in.
This is Justin Holt again. We appreciate your patience as we work out the technical difficulties to get Mr. Bennett reconnected so that he can give us his presentation about the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program resources available to us all and his expertise in representing licensed professionals through the disciplinary process. So again, we sincerely appreciate your patience and Bob, I expect will be right back with us momentarily. So let me, uh, it says muted by host. I'm muted by host. So can people hear me now? Okay, I, I can see everybody. I. Okay, so I'm going to start my video. Oh, that's the program. Okay, so I, I see that I'm on camera. I assume everybody can hear me, but I don't have the program up. So I need the program up. And I thought that um, Cynthia or somebody else was gonna start the program. That's where we left it last. So do we know whether the program is gonna be started or not? Uh, Bob, the PowerPoint is on, on everyone's screen. Everyone can see the PowerPoint. Um, okay, but I, can't, I can't see it. So what do I need to do to, I can sh share screen. Don't share screen. Okay. I'm not going to share screen. Okay. I see one screen up on the far right. Can I click on that and go from there? Uh, yeah, maybe try it. If you see your video try to click on the bottom right corner of your video that might open the webinar window back up okay okay let me take now i think i have that and i'll click here there you go. Okay, so I can see it right now. I'm sorry for the delay. Okay, let me uh, start uh, with uh, just a little brief introduction. Um, I used to be with a small firm called the Department of Justice, and I was a federal prosecutor for about five years. I've now practiced close to 46 years, and in the last 20 years, I've uh, practiced what I call representing doctors, lawyers, and judges who do not play well with others. The purpose of this seminar this morning, though, is to get you familiar with what has been happening in the grievance arena. We're going to talk about some of the new rules that have come up. We'll talk about some of the new uh, preventive steps you can take. 
but uh, in the last legislative session, some of the state senators got mad because they didn't see enough grievances being filed. And so they wanted to put in place additional weapons or additional steps that could be taken by what's called the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how they have been weaponized to be able to investigate more. And all that comes back to you, the individual practice of a small practice, which has traditionally been the target of the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel. As we can see that this is big business, uh, we collect uh, around $442 million uh, in revenue. Uh, we have a large staff in Austin. Um, here we go. And uh, uh, Mr. Watkins, who is a former member, uh, estimates that if you practice since uh, 1999, you're probably going to have at least two disciplinary complaints filed against you. And it doesn't uh, help to know that the Texas has one of the most complicated and expensive systems for handling grievances in the country. Uh, our present disciplinary system uh, starts off with anyone who wants to can file an inquiry. So you don't have to be a client. You don't have to be uh, a judge. You don't have to be anyone other than you feel that somehow a person has engaged in professional misconduct. So that's the first threshold. You just uh, are a person from the street, believe that there's been some type of professional misconduct and you can file an inquiry. Now that goes to the office of chief disciplinary counsel and then they decide whether or not they're gonna turn it into a complaint. And a complaint simply as another threshold which says, uh, would a reasonable person looking at this think that a violation has occurred. And that's all you need to get you to the next level to be investigated by the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel. Then you will get a letter from them saying, we think that you have violated the, uh, the rules, ethical rules, and uh, we, we need to have you respond. So the, the critical area and the most important area starting off and dealing with a grievance is this area when you're asked to respond to this complaint and whether they're going to turn it into the, I'm sorry, inquiry, whether they're going to actually turn it into a complaint. Now, uh, let me back off a little bit and go over a few ground rules here so that uh, I'll be sure to cover them uh, and we'll make sure that you understand some of the basics. Some of you have actually handled grievances. I understand that. Some of you may never had a grievance in your life. Some of you may be looking at a grievance right now. So there's some really good sources and I'll have it on this slide and make that available to anyone who wants it. But one of the first areas that you can go to for help with the uh, uh, complaint that's been filed against you is the uh, ethics uh, uh, hotline. And we have that number as part of this, the ethics hotline. The people that man that are very good. They're very uh, efficient and they'll get back to you within uh, 24 hours, if not sooner. You can't have your personal secretary or legal assistant or someone who is not a bar member call for you. They will only answer and talk to the attorney who calls them. But once you have them on the line, they are very helpful. Uh, they're not going to give you an advisory opinion, but they will talk to you. You can make notes and you can even send a note back to them just to memorialize that conversation. I had this question about my trust account. You answered it this way. I appreciate it very much. And then you have in the file, uh, not a memo from them, but a memo that you made having talked to them. So that 1-800 hotline number is a, in, indispensable and one of the best services the bar provides. Uh, they have now decided that there has been professional misconduct. Uh, they will investigate further. They'll ask for you to make a response. Once that's done, you will get a letter which says, we have found this uh, professional misconduct and you have the right now to have either an evidentiary hearing or you may go to civil district court. And going to civil district court is probably not the best choice. And the main reason for not going to civil district court is that if you take your case, take your grievance case to civil district court, you will not be entitled to a private reprimand. If you take it to the evidentiary panel, you then have the option 
uh, at least the, the panel has the option of giving you a, uh, a private reprimand, which is private and uh, is not supposed to be known by anybody. The uh, little uh, important fact you need to know, though, is that if the person who complains against you uh, find out that, and will find out that a private reprimand has been made, that private individual, non-attorney, can publicize that, and there's not a whole lot the bar will do about that. Okay, so this is the system in front of you dealing with how this process works. First is a grievance, it's classified then as a complaint. Uh, you do have a right for voluntary mediation, uh, dispute uh, resolution uh, at this early stage. I have never found that to be really helpful, but that's one of the new procedures they use. Uh, also, the uh, uh, Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel has been authorized at any step along the way to try to reach a resolution with you. So if at any step along the way you think you can negotiate uh, with them and reach some resolution, probably not a dismissal, but you can take a private reprimand, a public reprimand, a, uh, a reprimand of probation. Uh, you can uh, work out a disbarment. If that's what you think is in your best interest. Uh, there is uh, also uh, a, a program called the Grievance Referral Program. That's an excellent program. It's more of a uh, minor mis uh, procedural mistake. Uh, you had a, a mistake in accounting. Uh, you uh, really didn't uh, communicate as well, but it caused no harm. And so this uh, Grievance Program, Grievance Referral Program, uh, is also a good program to get into because again, there's no record of that. Uh, and uh, uh, they will allow you to take some CLE, maybe be uh, mentored, uh, maybe monitored. Uh, it can't be an outrageous outrageous situation or they're not gonna allow you into the grievance referral program, but that's a program we try to get our clients into if we can uh, negotiate that. Then you have your selection as I talked about earlier. You can go through the evidentiary hearing or you can go to district court. It's rare that you would actually want to go to district court, uh, but we are the, the only state in the uh, great union that allows you a jury trial on a grievance matter. And if it's something that you think uh, a jury should hear, if it's, well, or if it's something you think you can get rid of by summary judgment. So uh, depending on the judge, depending on the slam dunk nature of the facts, and you think that there's good law supporting that, uh, then that might be an option to try to get a summary judgment in district court. On the evidentiary hearing, that's appealed to the Board of Disciplinary Appeals. And then with the district court, you appeal to the Court of Appeals and ultimately to the Texas Supreme Court. Now, let me see if I cannot advance this a little more. Go. Uh, we now have a committee on disciplinary rules. This is a new process by which uh, we will be promulgating new grievance rules. If you have a problem with uh, one of the rules or you feel rules should be changed or you feel that a rule is too severe, uh, this is where the uh, uh, body is that will make the determination before it's uh, sent out to the um, uh, bar in general. What's happening right now, and I'm, I'm gonna take an aside here because I do want to talk about this in light of another thing, and that is uh, at the special director's meeting of the State Bar of Texas Board of Directors, there was a uh, motion made to have the bar look at uh, American Bar Association 804G, and we'll put that up and I'll explain to you uh, what that rule involves. That rule would has previously been ruled against by the Texas Supreme Court and by this committee, but given the, I, I would say the emotional tone, given what has happened at the last special directors meeting, this may be a new rule that will be considered. And basically it deals with any uh, uh, insults, any type of uh, detrimental statement, uh, race, class, gender, et cetera. Uh, if I'm in, in, in the rule 
is written. So you have to be in a situation of practice of law that's broadly uh, defined or social setting, social setting uh, within the practice of law. And I was trying to think exactly what that means or how that could be used. Okay, so going back again, this is not the law in Texas. This is not uh, it being recommended right now. It's being studied. This 804 rule would apply if I'm at a cocktail party with other lawyers, a recruiting party, and somebody hears me say, uh, you know, I think uh, Joe Jones over there is a real redneck, okay? That could be a violation. That could be a grievable offense. That could be a letter that you get from the Office of Chief District Counsel that you have violated if it's a, adopted 804. So I just want you to be aware of some of these uh, situations that are now being talked about by the bar. Uh, and that's not as far-fetched as you think. Uh, next. Uh, settlement authority. This is a new rule that allows the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel at any step along the process to try to work out uh, a settlement with the uh, party who's been charged. Uh, we're also establishing minimum standards and uh, procedures uh, and so that we try to have some uniformity of all sentences, whether you're in Westlaco, uh, the Panhandle, or, or Brownwood. Um, we now have, and this is an interesting concept, uh, we now have an ombudsman, and it uh, happens to be an attorney that I believe is over in the state bar, and this person will re review grievances, receive complaints about the system, receive and investigate complaints, answer questions from the public, assist members of the public wishing to submit a lawyer grievance. So now we've put in place, we've put in place a person to help our clients file grievances against us. Uh, this again grew out of the problems with the state legislature and the bar kind of bent over backwards and said, well, we'll even put an ombudsman in place to help people file grievances uh, against our members. I really have not seen this in action. I've called this person, talked to them generally about what they do. Seems like a reasonable person, but I'm just questioning the need that we really need uh, our bar dues going to the ombudsman to help somebody file grievances against us. Uh, maybe so. Uh, Baratry, uh, everybody knows what Baratry is, the illegal solicitation of cases. Uh, they want uh, the Office of Chief District Counsel to coordinate more with local law enforcement, uh, federal and state. If there is a Baratry charge, I think this is sort of a housekeeping procedure and keep information about that. Uh, you also have self-reporting if you charge with, with criminal offense in any area, state, uh, in the union, you're supposed to report that yourself. Uh, we are now have a National Lawyer Data Bank. I think some of you may be familiar with the uh, um, federal uh, data bank that deals with doctors. We're now having this with attorneys, and this is a new event. Um, online attorney profiles. I must now include a link on the attorney's online profile to the full text of disciplinary judgment entered by a district court, uh, di district a grievance committee or district court. So we want to be sure that the public knows what you've done if you've done something wrong. Um, these are the guidelines to uh, follow uh, and make sure that we have uniformity in, with our sentencing throughout the state. Uh, we're now allowed to do uh, investigative and disciplinary hearings by teleconference. The investigative hearing is a new weapon that the uh, Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel can use to further investigate whether a grievance has been committed or not. And we're seeing more of those and how you cooperate and the means of cooperation and whether you should cooperate or not is a, a issue that uh, we're dealing with right now. Um, uh, the committee conducting this investigation can issue subpoenas, can issue a subpoena uh, for your, your financial records, uh, and it's very difficult to have that quashed. 
uh, if you don't have the records, I guess that'd be one thing. If you do have the records, you're probably going to have to produce them. Uh, we do allow now to keep finger-based uh, fingerprints of all attorneys in the state of Texas. Um, I don't remember when I, I when I started practicing many years ago, that wasn't required, but it is required now. Uh, again, just in summary, I want to talk about going back again on the evidentiary hearing. It's the only place where you can get a private reprimand. Uh, the uh, rules are somewhat relaxed in an evidentiary hearing. In a civil jury trial, uh, the civil rules of procedure are followed and uh, there's no private reprimand. If there's one um, fix I would suggest that the committee look into, it's this, that you should have a private reprimand, both if you go to civil and if you go to uh, uh, an evidentiary hearing. And my screen has changed a little bit. Let me see what has happened there. Uh, okay, so now we're going to just look really statistics so you understand uh, in 2016, 2017, what areas are more susceptible to uh, uh, having a grievance filed against you. Uh, generally speaking, traffic tickets are not high on the list. For some reason my screen keeps jumping around uh, and I'm not touching anything, but I will keep uh, going no matter what. Uh, the uh, Um, okay, these are these are the violations by uh, uh, percentages. Uh, integrity uh, deals with uh, uh, bar admission is really one of the largest uh, segments when we have people that falsify information. It doesn't really apply to practicing attorneys like you, but uh, these are some issues that uh, do come up. Uh, the, always the issue comes up of reporting of professional misconduct. That's a very subjective test whether you should do that. Uh, very few grievances are ever brought against an attorney for failing to report, but that is a uh, violation. I'm going to go on here and just keep with me. Uh, this is an area that I want to talk about a little bit, declining and terminating representation. Um, one of the big areas that we touch on from time to time is um, what to do with the file and who owns the file. And one of the things that I have uh, come across, and I don't have ownership in this uh, software package, but uh, an organization that puts out a thing called My Case, that's an online program. And the reason I like that and tied into terminating and declining representation is that that file, uh, once it's in the cloud and once you have access to it, and once the client has access to it, uh, it's permanently there. And you can uh, deny access to the client. But at the time you're finishing up with a case, and again, doing traffic tickets, I know that it's uh, you don't keep extensive files, but at least have the basic information on the client on that computer system so that if that client wants to see something, you're able to show them uh, something as opposed to uh, having that ticket and just throw it away. So some of, some of you have more sophisticated programs than others, uh, but uh, the client owns the file and whatever that file is, and if it's kept on a in the cloud or kept on a program like this, it's easier to maintain, easier to give them access, and you will see what they will see, they see what you see, and there's not a problem with returning the file to them, okay? Um, safeguarding property, uh, response to trust account management, safeguarding, if the, if obviously if they give you a wedding ring, if they give you something like that, uh, that is a uh, an item that if you don't return it or there's an issue about that, that certainly will get you in hot water with the office of chief business and counsel. Conflicts of, of interest, uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. I think you know if you've represented somebody and uh, there was a, a conflict with that person coming back with another client, that's the reason you need to have a ledger, you need to have a list of your clients to make sure that there isn't a conflict with this. Uh, illegal fees or un unconscionable fees, uh, really this f falls more into the uh, division of a fee and um, 
that's really not the purpose of this talk. I'm happy to get into that or if you have a question about that to um, answer that. Uh, but generally, you have very few grievable offenses with this uh, violation of fees. Uh, advertising solicitation. Uh, this has become a little bit more active, and I see some grievances filed about this. Uh, obviously, the best way to protect yourself is to contact the State Bar of Texas Advertising Review Committee. Uh, you send your fee, your uh, uh, video in, you send your advertising in, I think you charge now $75, $100, but once you get the premature from them, uh, you're home safe. Uh, tribunals, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, this is a violation, um, making uh, false statements to others, but that uh, less than 1%. Okay, in 2016, 2017, we had over 2,000 grievances filed, uh, 545 evidentiary hearings, 343 sanctions, and you can see how those worked out um, between 30 public reprimands and 50 grievance referral program. Generally, if the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel can put you into the grievance referral program, they will try to do that. Uh, again, this will be up and you can copy it down uh, and uh, get more information about uh, these protections. I put up here, this is State Bar of Texas Ethics Hotline. Write it down, 1-800-532-3947. Let me repeat that. 1-800-532-3947. Uh, the, uh, we have a committee that issues uh, written opinions. Unfortunately, that takes a long time. Uh, be familiar with the advertising rules. You can become familiar with advertising rules by contacting the uh, State Bar of Texas Advertising Review Committee and asking them. Uh, obviously, keep client files. Um, generally, in trust areas, I've heard that it's a four-year. Generally speaking, um, if you, especially if you have a um, program that allows you to close the file and you always have that with you in the cloud, then that's probably the best way to do it. The same thing with these programs that uh, uh, on my, my case, I keep track of all telephone calls uh, and other records can be maintained, uh, documents, etc. with that uh, program. Um, keep your client fully informed, phone call promptly, do not engage with sex with the client, uh, if you do get into fee dispute, there are, depending on the amount, there is the, in Houston, the Harris County Dispute Resolution Committee, which I think usually tries to do a, a good job, trains staff, uh, bar resources, uh, substance abuse, maintain professional relationships. We're getting now to the end of this. Um, you got to take it seriously. If you're going to make a response uh, to a complaint that's been filed, make it as complete, as full a response as you can. Uh, we've used experts, we've used depositions, we've used uh, uh, signed statements to try to make sure it does not go uh, further into the system. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit and we're getting ready to play this video on TLAP. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I got involved with TLAP, and I'm a Harris County attorney, is that um, uh, three years ago, I had five friends commit suicide, and um, I wanted to do something about that, and so uh, Joe Longley appointed me to the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program, and we're going to see a video in just a minute about it, but uh, the major problems for attorneys, as you know, is stress, anxiety, depression, alcohol, substance abuse, cognitive impairment. Um, I want to say that... Uh, this slide, uh, we've kind of touched on that, but I want to go into right here. Uh, the, the, and this is somewhat of a, uh, another issue that attorneys suffer from, and that's secondary trauma. Uh, you have threats from criminal defendants. You see a client lose custody matter, being yelled at by a client, uh, dealing uh, in PI and in traffic tickets, you see some horrible things. And that secondary trauma can almost be as devastating as uh, actual trauma. TLAP, and uh, again, Texas Lawyers Assistance Program, I can't emphasize enough, and I'll keep emphasizing, that anytime you call them, call the 800 number, it's totally confidential. 
Uh, you can call them for somebody else. You can call them to uh, request in right circumstances and intervention. Uh, there are trained professionals to handle all sorts of uh, calls. There are TLAP and lawyers concerned about lawyers, meetings that you can attend by Zoom, attend by um, uh, phone call. One-on-one uh, -on -one peer support is available. Uh, there's a number of videos on the TLAP um, website, and there's certainly service opportunities. Uh, this is our, your staff. This is where your money goes to help support uh, TLAP. Uh, Chris Ritter uh, is an attorney who's gone through recovery. He's an attorney that got a master's degree in education, is the uh, head honcho of, of TLAP and does a fabulous job. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I wish we could duplicate Chris because uh, he has so many demands on his time uh, and does such a good job. Uh, Shauna is a licensed therapist who uh, is also available uh, and does an excellent job on presentations. Uh, Erica Grigg is an Austin attorney who went through recovery, tells her story, helps others with their story, and is available to talk. And Penny uh, runs the whole place and uh, is a great uh, administrative assistant. Um, take it seriously, prepare a thorough response. Uh, these are the, the uh, ethics hotlines. There's the Texas Center for Legal Ethics, Houston, uh, and other, si other sites on this, including if you really want to get into some of the nitty gritty of uh, ethics rulings, there's the Cornell University site. And uh, final thought, I'm going to do one other thing here. We've talked about 804, I may come back to that. Are y'all ready now to show the video, the TLAP video? Can you hear me? So we're gonna go now and watch this video and uh, I'll come back after that. So I'm waiting for the video to play. And while we're getting this up and running, uh, this was made by Texas Lawyers Assistance Program and may actually be some people that you know. So. Uh, Practicing law in Texas is challenging, exciting, important, meaningful, rewarding, adventurous, giving, heroic, helping. Helping others is what brought many of us to the practice of law. But most attorneys don't know how to help themselves. Lawyers need help because practicing law can also be difficult, time consuming, intense, consequential, traumatic, serious, exhausting, stressful, overwhelming. Many lawyers will face challenges that will affect their mental health. 46% of attorneys deal with depression at some point in their practice. 28% currently suffer from depression. Attorneys also struggle with trying to self-medicate these stresses. 21% of attorneys are serious problem drinkers. 32% of attorneys 30 and under have a drinking problem. When we suffer from anxiety, depression, or other problems, we can't do our best for our clients and we can't be the person we want to be for our community and family. We are here to send a strong message to our legal community that it's time that we recognize one thing. It's good to get help. Getting help is a big deal, whether it's getting help from a therapist, like many of us have done, or getting other kinds of professional treatment. Or getting connected to a 12-step group or a lawyer's concern for lawyer's support group. Finding a peer who has been through what you're going through is tremendous. Getting help can provide you peace of mind, joy, healthy boundaries, recovery, a process to overcome grief and depression, connection to others, resilience, support, encouragement, motivation, happiness. Getting help is a big deal. I've gotten it, and I am proud to stand for this message. 
Getting help has changed my life and made me the lawyer I am today. Getting help allowed me to stop wasting time stuck in my head and get things done. Getting help to stop drinking has changed my life. Getting help has allowed me to process grief. Getting help allowed me to manage stress. Getting help has given me a new outlook on practicing law. Getting help has filled me back up so I can continue to help others in my practice. Getting help has allowed me to find recovery. Getting, Getting help, help enabled, enabled me, me to, to quit, quit drinking, drinking so, so I, I could, could be, be there, there for, for my, my dad. Daughter. The Board of Law Examiners and the Chief Disciplinary Council in Texas agree. It's, it's good, good to, to get, get help. help. Getting help shows that a person is taking care of him or herself. It's good to get help. We don't want to lose more members of our law family to suicide. TLAP is able to connect lawyers, law students, and judges to many resources and can even help them get funding through the Sharon Crowley Trust for Mental Health and Substance Use Care. Not only do we want to encourage lawyers to get help, we want Texas law students to know from the outset that getting help is a good thing. What we learn in law school matters, and learning to get help when it is needed is fundamental to becoming a good lawyer. Getting help isn't something we should be ashamed of. It's something we tell our clients to do every day. Lawyers and law students aren't usually trained in how to manage mental health. Why would we think we can solve those problems alone? It's good to get help. For a profession that carries the worst burdens of our clients every day, practicing law can become overwhelming. We need to fill up and we need to know how. We did and we urge you to do the same without shame. It's good to get help. Okay, so uh, I think I'm back up now and then kind of concluding uh, this part of uh, what we did is to go over some of the grievance procedures so you'll be familiar with them. I think the most important point that I wanna make is that if you do get a letter from our friends at the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel, you try to have uh, some other attorney, uh, you talk to some other attorney about it. Uh, I'm always happy to, uh, with no charge, talk to an attorney about that letter and then see where it goes from there. Uh, there's uh, other resources, including the hotline, uh, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough, and my good friend Steve Fisher has actually made a proposal that deals with the fact that too many attorneys take that letter, stick it in a drawer, and forget about it, and they just freak out. And uh, there may be some way we can address that issue, uh, but that's not for this talk. But the point is, if you do receive, or you think you're going to get a complaint, or you have that client that you think that is going to file some complaint against you, don't just throw it away. Talk to somebody. There are a lot of resources. Uh, talk to TLAP. Uh, talk to lawyers concerned with lawyers uh, and do something about that. And then we went into the services that TLAP provides. Uh, there's money for medication. There's money for rehab. There's money for counselors. Uh, there's groups that meet uh, every week. You can tune in and be part of an organization that talks. Uh, you can call in and, and, and find out other people involved in that. Uh, and so that would be another way to do it, uh, to get connected. Finally, uh, I just want you to be aware of, uh, you may be seeing something come along about 804 and uh, how that rule may change uh, how we view uh, professional misconduct. So with that, uh, I'm gonna hang around. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'll be at the end of the talk or any time the questions are asked. And uh, thank you for having me. And if you're in Houston sometime, uh, we may even find a restaurant uh, with our mask and social distancing uh, that we can have a cup of coffee. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. We very much appreciate your presentation. For those that would like to address questions directly to Mr. Bennett, he can be reached at his email address, which is bob at bennettlawfirm.com. That's B-E-N-N-E-T-T -T, lawfirm.com and on his website at bennettlawfirm.com. We appreciate 
your presentation, Mr. Bennett. As a reminder, the resources identified in Bob's uh, materials are available online at TLAP Helps, that's all one word, T-L-A-P-H-E-L-P-S dot O-R-G, and at the State Bar of Texas Office of Disciplinary Counsel online. Bill Pewitt acted as legislative lobbyist and liaison for the Traffic Lawyers of Texas Bar Association from our inception. And after 27 years, Mr. Pewitt retired from his position as our lobbyist last year in 2019. We are very excited to establish a new relationship with the Texas Star Alliance. Eric Neustrom serves as legislative counsel for Texas Star Alliance. Eric has more than 20 years of legal experience in ranging from litigation to legislative drafting. Eric is an expert in legislative drafting and research and works with legislators, stakeholders, and legislative counsel to craft meaningful legislation to bring policy into practice. And as all of you well know, Texas is uh, every other year legislative um, assembly meeting, and we are in a legislative year. And at this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Newstrom. Eric, the floor is yours. Hello. Y'all should see me in just a moment. Hi. Um, my name is Eric Knustrom. I'm a principal at Texas Star Alliance. Um, thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and my primary um, practice partner, uh, our group, and then a little bit about what we think uh, the 86th session of the legislature will look like this coming January. Um, I went to the University of Texas School of Law, uh, graduated in 2001. Immediately afterwards, I went to work for LexisNexis. Um, so some of you watching this, I may have been your Lexus rep. Um, I had no gray hair then and um, didn't have a beard. So I might look a little different. Um, after working for LexisNexis for 10 years, um, I had a, few, a career in, for a few years uh, working in um, discovery services with electronic discovery and then found my way to the Texas legislature about eight years ago. Um, I began working uh, with Texas Star Alliance six years ago. And since then I've been representing clients and working with the legislature. Um, my primary practice partner and your other main contact at Texas Star Alliance is Chad Cantella. Um, Chad has been a principal with Texas Star Alliance since it was formed. And he has roughly 30 years of experience in Texas politics. He was a uh, campaign strategist for the first 18 or, or so years of his career. And then he became a government affairs professional. Um, and our experience and practice uh, ranges from healthcare issues to education, to criminal justice, law enforcement. Um, we even do a little bit of work on elections and ethics laws. Um, we're excited to be working for the traffic lawyers. Um, we interact regularly with the stakeholders in your area. We spend a lot of time in the committees where the issues that will directly affect you and your issues uh, come up. So we think we're um, a very good match for the issues that y'all will be addressing. Um, Texas Star Alliance overall is a firm of 17 principal lobbyists and three associates at this time. Uh, we function a lot like a law firm. Each principal or partner, to use law firm terms, uh, has their own practice and focuses on the needs of their clients. However, as a group, we do fundraising, we do campaign meetings. We are completely bipartisan and agnostic when it comes to party. Um, we do work with every single office. Um, some of our principals have worked for members of the legislature. Some have been members of the legislature. Uh, but when it comes to politics, our main priority is to address the needs of our clients and advance their desires. Um, the benefit of our activity, though, is that we give uh, to campaigns and to candidates as members of Texas Star Alliance. So. When you retain someone from Texas Star Alliance, uh, you get the benefit of the dollars that um, we use to support candidates and campaigns uh, throughout um, the 
election season. And uh, as much as you hate to say it, um, that is part of the equation of getting to see people and part of the way that the system works. So that's a little bit about us. And uh, I thought what I'd tell you about next is um, what our marching orders are um, from the group and your, from your leaders. And then what I think um, we could expect from the coming session. Um, primarily what we'll be doing for y'all is monitoring the legislature, uh, meeting with other stakeholders and trying to understand what the landscape will be um, for bills and policy changes that could potentially affect your practice as session goes forward. Um, we've already identified a couple measures that members are talking about filing um, and having bills on the table um, that will affect you. And what we'll do when session starts is make sure that we're tracking those bills and forming um, your board and having them let you know what's going on. And then when the bills start to move, we will make sure that you're in the right positions to testify on them, to advocate with members. Um, if it's a bill that you like and you would like to see advanced, we'll make sure that you meet with the members of the committee that will get it to the floor of both the House and the Senate. And if it's one that we think is bad legislation that shouldn't advance, we'll do the same to make sure that it doesn't go forward. Um, before the pandemic struck, um, people had already dubbed the 86th legislative session as the criminal justice reform session. Uh, there was quite a bit of momentum behind federal criminal justice reform from the current administration uh, aided by celebrities and the first step act was very much a product of a texas-based policy group texas public policy foundation and their right on crime uh, project now that group has turned their attention to state criminal justice reform and much of what they will be doing this session will be focused on Texas and Texas policy. And as part of that, there will be many, many proposals that will either directly or tangentially uh, relate to the practice of law in municipal courts and definitely to traffic lawyers practicing in Texas. So we have kept our ear to the ground um, and we are, will begin immediately sending reports um, to our contacts with your group so that they can inform you of what's going on and if necessary, motivate members in given districts to influence the key members of the legislature on, that legis on those legislative matters so that we are ahead of the curve when it comes time to have a hearing in a committee. Until then, our job will simply be to make sure that we're staying in touch with legislators, legislators, their staff and stakeholders. That includes associations, advocates groups, and then the large public policy foundations. Um, but that job has been made a little harder with the pandemic. Um, at this point, we'd normally be in the building a lot, talking to members and talking to their staff. The Capitol is still closed. Um, all meetings are happening over Zoom. And so we're spending a lot of the time in front of our computers. Um, we're spending a lot of the time on the phone talking to people about what their plans are and, and how exactly session will go. There has been a document that was drafted by a longtime Capitol staffer and insider um, that was shared through Quorum Report, which is sort of a uh, media outlet that's targeted at the Capitol crowd uh, that I will share with your folks to forward around in, a, in attached uh, to this CLE that gives a very, very accurate picture of what everyone thinks uh, this session will look like. During a normal session, you have public access to the Capitol, people come and go, people can come to committee rooms and sit all day waiting to testify. Um, the picture for the 86th legislative session looks very different. Um, testifying will be difficult, uh, PPE will be required, and so we just want to make sure that anybody who comes to the Capitol to advocate on y'all's behalf is completely prepared and understands uh, what to expect. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we have a website, it's www.texasstaralliance.com. Um, I invite y'all to take a look at it, to take a look at some of the white papers we've written. Um, obviously my contact information is there if you wanna shoot me an email and ask me any specific questions. But other than that, we stand ready to advocate on your behalf and um, to make sure that only good policy comes out of the 86th legislative session that will affect the traffic lawyers of Texas. Justin, unless there's any questions,
No, I do not see any questions. We very much look forward to working with you now and into the future. And we also are excited to see you in person in Austin this coming January. Excellent. Our, our final presentation today will be from Caroline Ortego and Addie Wayland, and we'll focus on identifying and effectively mitigating the unique personal and professional stresses related to the COVID-19 outbreak. Caroline Ortego is the owner and sole attorney of the Ortego Law Firm, PLLC, and has been practicing estate planning and probate for the past 10 years. She is experienced in end-of-life planning services and has extensive experience with the Texas Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. Caroline regularly serves as an ad litem, attorney ad litem in airship, guardianship, and tax foreclosure proceedings. Addie Wayland is a licensed clinical social worker board approved supervisor and is the owner and counselor of Everyday Bravery Counseling, an online private practice working with adults who have experienced trauma and those who struggle with shame, perfectionism, and poor self-worth. Ladies, the floor is yours. I don't see our PowerPoint up, but, oh, there it is. I think it's coming up. There it is. Can you guys, I don't think you can see me. Yeah, I can see you. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you so much to the Traffic Lawyers of Texas for having us today for this presentation. Um, the inspiration for this presentation was my experience with my clients this year. Um, I'm used to doing a lot of uh, counseling with what I do, but this year it's increased dramatically since we've all been home and isolated. And um, I reached out to my Facebook attorney friends and I said, is anybody else experiencing this? And are you spending more time as a counselor slash therapist than you are an actual practicing attorney, does it feel like? And um, people came back with res um, referring me to Addie Wayland. Um, the licensed therapist who's going to give our main presentation today. Um, she specializes in grief, trauma, burnout, and compassion fatigue. And those are all things that I feel like are in my life right now. <laughs> grief for the life I used to have, um, the trauma of my clients and my family members, and burnout and compassion fatigue for, for sure. Um, so I've met with Addie on Zoom, as we do now, and at first, I started talking about how I could be a better attorney, how I could better help my clients that seem to be having trouble making decisions and responding to me. And the more I talked, the more I realized, what about myself? You know, this is a global pandemic. It's affecting everyone, just like Harvey affected us regionally as a whole. COVID-19 is affecting everybody. Nobody's getting out without damage. And... Um, my life is completely different than it was before mid-March. And um, I'm having stress and confusion as well. And I'm used to being the helper as the attorney. I'm the professional. I'm there. I'm being paid to be objective and to make recommendations and to carry things out. But what happens when the helper needs help? And we're now the helpy. So, um, that's what our talk is about today. And I'm really grateful to Addie because she's gonna help us better understand what's going on with us and what's going on with our clients. And she's gonna give us some strategies to succeed. And um, just a couple of examples from myself, how have I dealt with um, the stress of this experience? And one of those things is Facebook. I've used a lot more to reach out, make new friends with attorneys, um, revitalize old relationships with friends from the past. And more important than that, I've learned a lot more about compassion and forgiveness for myself for not being perfect. You know, um, a lot of us in this profession hold ourselves to a very high standard as we should, but what happens when things are going on around us and we really can't do that. And I think what we can do is forgive ourselves and be compassionate for ourselves. So with that said, I'm going to give the presentation over to Addie Wayland and she's going to give us some strategies. Thanks. 
Thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. Um, hi, guys. I'm so excited to be here. So as she said, my name is Addie Leland, and I have been in this field for about 10 years now. Um, most of my experience, expertise, training all lies within trauma. I worked a lot in trauma in my previous jobs, um, and with my clients now I work a lot with trauma. And of course, with trauma comes a lot of uh, struggles with self-worth, grief, all the things that we kind of already talked about. Um, on a more personal level, my connection to the attorney world is my mom is actually an attorney. As she started off as a defense attorney and then moved on to insurance and then moved on to immigration, which talk about burnout and compassion fatigue. That is a tough job. Um, now she is a happily retired grandma. So she likes that job much better <laughs> sometimes. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna talk to you guys a little bit about COVID stress and what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation. Let me make sure that I can change the slide. Sometimes it takes a minute. There you go. I'm going to start the presentation just by laying out some of the things that maybe you guys have been experiencing right now. So just take a look at that list um, and see if you guys can see yourself, you know, with any of these these check boxes. No need to raise your hand or anything. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of us or all of us have been experiencing a lot of these things. I know people have really talked about COVID that it's kind of like a wave, right? Comes in waves and that um, in the beginning, I feel like it was, we were kind of confused, like what's really going on? Is this really happening? Is this the twilight zone? Like we were way off balance. Um, I can remember specifically going to HEV for the first time, you know, and everybody was wearing masks and gloves and the, the shields. And I was like, this is like the most bizarre thing, you know, just to see it in person. Uh, so with that, we've been experiencing a lot of these symptoms and a lot of these symptoms are related to like PTSD and trauma and people that have experienced a lot of trauma because really what we're experiencing is kind of a collective traumatic experience. Um, and the really unique thing about this situation that I've found and that I'm sure you guys have also found with your clients is that never in my career have I been in the same boat at the same time with my clients. Now, I will say not the exact same boat, right? Because we know that COVID affects people very differently, obviously very much affects minorities and um, the elderly and immune compromise and all those things and different industries are being affected differently too, right? So not necessarily the exact same boat, but a very similar boat. And I can remember when COVID first kind of hit and I was trying to like hold space for my clients and do all the good things that I, that I'm really good at. You know, I feel, I have truly been felt called to my profession. I've, I've known kind of from day one when I was younger that I wanted to be a counselor and help people. And never have I ever questioned my career ever until COVID, seriously, I remember going to my husband and just telling him like, man, how am I supposed to hold space for all these people when I can't even hold space for myself? You know, I can't even really help myself right now. How am I supposed to help kind of all these people that were going through this similar struggle together? And I remember laughing and telling him like, I really wish like right now I just worked in numbers. Like just don't take away all the emotions. I just wish I worked in numbers. But truly it's just a a very bizarre, almost remarkable time for people to be experiencing very similar things that their clients are experiencing at the exact same time, which can look like a lot of these symptoms right here. Um, and I think kind of to speak what, with what Caroline was talking about, the important thing is I think when we think about kind of all of these symptoms and the things that we're experiencing with COVID, is yeah, just to kind of give ourselves a little a little grace, right? Um, to kind of be able to work through this big pandemic. So you're asking like, how do we do that? I'm gonna go next slide. Okay, so this is uh, the arousal continuum. I am super, super into the brain. That's like another kind of passion uh, subject for me. Done a whole lot of training about interpersonal neurobiology, which is kind of a connection between the brain and therapy. Um, and really into like neuroscience and learning all about the brain. It's like my jam. I could go on a slide forever, so I will try to keep it concise. Um, so this is the arousal continuum. 
It's based off the work of Dr. Bruce Perry, who is a world-renowned uh, child psychiatrist in the world of child trauma, and he kind of came up with this, although there's other models that are very, very similar. I just like to use this one. I show this to all of my clients because it pertains to all of us, really, not just people who have experienced trauma, but all of us, but specifically people who have experienced trauma. This is really, really important. So what this is, these five states, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, these we're in this planet are in these five states 20 hours a day. So it's calm, alert, alarm, afraid. And really with the afraid, there's kind of like fear and terror. So there's kind of more states, but this is a simple, simplified version of it. Um, hopefully you can still hear me because my internet connection is unstable. But when we are in calm, as you can see up here, our thinking is very creative, analytical, and we're really our best selves. This is when we have full access of this front part of the brain, which that frontal lobe, um, and if any of you guys are really into neuroscience, this is a very simplified version, so don't be like, this is way more complicated than that. Totally way more complicated than this, but simplifying it, because the brain's very complicated. Uh, so when we're in calm, we have full access to this frontal, frontal cortex. That frontal cortex is the last to develop. It doesn't develop until we're 25. Um, it's the part that we're able to have a lot of forward thinking. So we're able to think, hmm, maybe we shouldn't eat like the whole bowl of ice cream because we'll be sick later, right? Um, we're able to communicate with that frontal cortex. We're able just to make really, really good decisions. And really when we're calm, we're our absolute best self, honestly. Uh, we have really good ideas. That's why a lot of people maybe have really good ideas when they're in the shower typically when we're in the shower, we're pretty calm and we have good ideas. Um, typically outside of COVID, since COVID has now kind of turned our house into something different than it normally was, we are calm when we're at home. If home is a safe place, which we know that not a, for not everybody home is a safe place, but if home um, is a safe place for you before COVID, you probably were able to be calm there, relax, you know, kind of get that calm state. Now with COVID, it's even harder to kind of access that calm because home isn't necessarily a safe place, right? Home is where we work. Maybe it's where we homeschool our kids. Don't even get me started on that topic. Um, home is just lots of different things for us right now. So it might not be the safest place right now. And really to access that calm, it might be a specific place in your house, right? So maybe the bathtub, um, maybe your bed, maybe outside that might be able to access calm, but really it's, it's changed. Usually we can feel calm when we're at home and that looks differently now. When we move down the continuum, so when we go out and about on our day, go to work, um, do certain things, we move more into that alert. So our thinking is a little bit more concrete and, uh, because we can't just totally totally be like zen when we're out and about, right? We have to kind of be paying attention, doing all these things. It gets more alert. For the majority of people, um, normally pre-COVID, you would spend most of your time in alert, unless you have experiences of trauma, which I'm really not going to get into today. But that would kind of be your baseline, would be alert. Access and calm when you're home. Um, then, I forgot to say, it takes seconds to kind of move down the continuum. So if you think about like a near car accident when you're driving your car down the road and you almost run into somebody, it takes seconds to move down to like that afraid, that fear, terror, like, oh my God, I almost got in a car accident, like freaking out. Um, and then it takes a much longer time to get back to calm. So usually it's not like seconds and you're back at calm, right? It takes maybe your whole ride, car ride home sometimes to like access calm and feel calm and like relax and all that good stuff. So seconds to go down, it takes a while to come back up is an important to remember. And we kind of move up and down the continuum based on things that are happening in our environment. Uh, and right now, normally, you know, things that might not trigger us are probably even more triggering now because of COVID. So we might be moving down the continuum more often than not just because of everything that's going, down, going on right now. And I would venture to say that a lot of our baseline is not really alert anymore, but kind of more that alarm state. And maybe between alarm and, uh, alert and alarm because of everything that's going on and we just can't catch our balance. We can't access calm as much as we can, right? So when we're in that afraid state, our thinking is on reflex. We have 
really no access or very limited access to our thinking brain and we're fully back in the brainstem. Uh, the brainstem is a very, very important part of the brain, but it's not very sophisticated. Uh, really with our brainstem, it helps us control these autonomic, I always have trouble saying that, autom automatic, <laughs> automatic systems like our breathing, our heart rate, our blood flow, our blood flow, but it doesn't really have any forward thinking. It has no forward thinking at all. It thinks in seconds. So it does things very, very impulsively. Um, we cannot communicate in our brainstem. So we really can't talk to people when we're in our brainstem. We have absolutely no access to reason when we're in our brainstem. So when we're in our brainstem, we're really not a bad at all. And as you can see, our IQ goes down dramatically from our IQ when we're in calm. When we're in our brainstem, we tend to do things that we normally wouldn't do, maybe like go on a shopping spree on Amazon with a credit card, even though we're not supposed to. Um, say things that we don't mean. This is when we snap at our kids, snap at our husbands, um, you know, partner wives, all those things. We just typically are really, really not our best selves when we're in that back part of the brain. And the more that we stay there, the harder that it is to come out. Uh, so normally we're supposed to kind of move in between the states naturally, right? Like we're going about our day, we start at calm, we get more alert when we're on our way to work, maybe something happens, pushes us to alarm, we get more alert all of that kind of stuff, we kind of move up and down. You know, the tricky part with COVID, which I'm gonna show you guys in the next slide, is that it's just hard to access that calm like I was talking about. So we typically tend to stay a lot in those lower states, which basically we're just not really our best self in those states, right? Um, and it's kind of like a mindset switching from living to more kind of that survival mode. So a really huge thing is just to practice lowering our expectations when we're kind of in these modes. And one quick thing you might be asking, um, how do I know which state that I'm in? Like, how will I know exactly? The best and easiest way to know is to get connected to your body. Your body is always going to tell you first because our body knows first before our mind can catch up. And a really good example of that is when we're about to touch um, or we touch something hot and our hand recoils instantly really quickly before our mind says like, hey, dummy, don't touch that, right? It's hot. Um, our body is gonna tell us. So a really good exercise that I have a lot of my clients do is, hey, just map out your body, how your body feels in each of these states. So when you're calm, what do you kind of notice about your body, right? Probably your shoulders are a lot more relaxed. Your face is not as scrunched. Um, your breathing is normal or even like very deep breathing, you'll, you'll know, you'll really know how your body feels. Maybe alert, in between the states, there's going to be probably small nuances between that in terms of how your body feels, but definitely between calm and afraid, you're going to know, right? Your heart rate's going to be super, super fast. Your breathing's going to be shallow or you might be holding your breath. Um, you'll definitely know by paying attention to your body when you're in that afraid state versus that calm state. And so pay, just kind of getting more in tune to your body is going to help you figure out which state you're in. So that's a really good exercise to kind of help you figure, figure that out. And I'll talk more about the body in a little bit. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. That's kind of just a really quick way about the arousal continuum. And what I was talking about in terms of uh, COVID and why it's been why it feels a little bit different is because of this. This is also another slide from Dr. Bruce Perry. He talks a lot about this. So stress is normally sort of a good thing when it comes to how much it is, how intense it is, and how much we get breaks in between, right? So uh, normal everyday stress that you might experience at work, at home, that's pretty predictable, pretty moderate, pretty like bite size that you can manage. It, that helps push us, right? That helps motivate us to like get things done. That helps encourage us. Um, it can be a good thing in small doses. So it can kind of lead to resiliency. But when we come to the stress that we're all kind of experiencing right now because of COVID and all of the aspects of our life that it's affecting financial, physical, emotional, mental, um, you know, everything, everything. 
it's very, and talk about unpredictable, right? Like in terms of, we don't know when it's gonna end and so many different questions, no end in sight, uh, pretty severe stress, it's constant. That is what leads to a lot of vulnerability and our bodies are not made to be in that afraid state for long. We're just not built for that. And if we are in that afraid state for long, what happens, and you might be noticing this yourself, is that our body tends to shut down in order to protect us because it has to like conserve energy somehow, right? It cannot be go at that state of alarm for so long. So this can look like, I feel like a lot of us might be in this state right now because we're just over it, right? We're just over all of it. Um, but it can feel a lot like apathy, you know, numbing, overwhelmed, despair, um, just a whole lot of numbing I feel like is happening right now for sure. And numbing just can be with anything. It doesn't have to be with alcohol and drugs. It can be with work. It can be with Netflix. It can be with ice cream. It can be really with anything with excess was what we kind of like numb where we don't focus so much on our feelings and just kind of numb our feelings and pretend that uh, nothing's happening. So that is why COVID feels different than maybe normal everyday stress, even like intense stress, because typically that has like an end point and, you know, we're, we've been in it for a long time with not a real end point in sight. So I think that is why COVID feels very differently right now. So then you're like, great, Addy, I'm in afraid. Uh, what do we, what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do to kind of help myself access that calm? I'm going to tell you. So if you forget everything that I talk about today, I really, really hope that what you, one thing you take from this is the three R's, which is another uh, Dr. Bruce Perry thing. He really uh, talks about this a lot. I use this all the time in session with myself, everybody. So the three R's are regulate, relate, and reason. <clears throat> and when we are in that afraid state, we want to do things in sequence. So we want to regulate ourselves first before we can kind of relate to ourselves. And um, I'm not going to go too much into relate and reason because I don't have a whole lot of time. But relating is more about being kind to ourselves, kind of what Caroline was talking about, being self-compassionate to ourselves. Um, if you're interested in that, I'm actually doing a four-part series on self-compassion on my Facebook page, but I'm not going to go into that today. But relate is being more kind to ourselves. Relate is being able to connect with others. And then reason, of course, is just, you know, reasoning with ourselves and with others. But we cannot do those two things when we're in our brainstem. So when we're in our brainstem, the only kind of thing that it understands at that time when we're in that afraid state, fear and terror, is regulation. The brainstem does not care, does not give to, you know what, about reason. It just doesn't. It just doesn't care about reason. So if you've ever experienced a panic attack or even really, really strong anxiety, which we're probably all feeling right now, you probably um, can relate to this. So when you're in that, uh, when you're having a panic attack or high anxiety, and if somebody's around you or <clears throat> if you're by yourself, typically what people try to do because they're not aware of this, which is totally fine. When we know better, we do better, right? Is they try to reason, uh, you know, if somebody else is with you, they're gonna try to reason with you or you're gonna try to reason with yourself when you're in full blown panic. So somebody with you might say like, hey, like, it's okay. Like, you know, just, just it's fine. You know, whatever the situation is, um, there's more fish in the sea if it's about a breakup or you can get another job or it's all right. Like they'll start trying to fix it, right? Trying to help you reason, trying to, trying to help you rationalize all of those things, which is great and definitely has its place for sure, but not at that time because the brainstem, it's not, does not sink in at that time. The brainstem, um, I don't know if I'm dating myself here, but it's like the Charlie Brown uh, adults, right? That's all the brainstems hears when a person or you are trying to reason with yourself. It is not sinking in. The brainstem does not understand language. And you can even, if you guys have um, toddlers, I have a toddler. <laughs> so if you have toddlers, you know this because when they're throwing that full blown tantrum and you're trying to like talk to them, 
guys, just stop. <laughs> it's not sinking in, right? We have to kind of regulate them first. It's the same thing because we're kind of in our toddler brain when we're in our brainstem. So brainstem does not understand reason, which means we cannot reason with ourselves or others can't reason with us when we're in that state to help get us access to calm. What it does understand is regulation. And so you might be saying, well, what the heck is regulation? Regulation is super, super simple. Very simple. You guys are going to be like, are you serious? Anything that is rhythmic and repetitive is going to be regulating and soothing to us. So anytime you can bring rhythm into your life, it's going to be helpful for you. And you probably already do without you knowing it um, because we naturally kind of just lean towards those more rhythmic things. And you might be asking, well, why is rhythm? I don't understand. Like, why is rhythm so important? And this is just a total tidbit aside because I think it's so fascinating. But the reason, the reason that rhythm is so important is it has to do with when we were in our mother's womb. That's where we all started, right? When we're in our mother's womb, that's the safest place we'll ever be. We were the perfect temperature. Um, we were not hungry, right? Because we're constantly being fed by the, by the I'm going to say tube, but the cord. And so per pretty much that was like nirvana. We'll never get back to that. So we were in a, literally a perfect state when we're in utero. Um, and we're, you know, we're not alone because we can hear our mother's voices or other voices around us. So that feeling of safety, security, all of that stuff is paired with what constant sound 24 hours. The heartbeat, right? So the heartbeat kind of connects safety, connection, all of that stuff with the rhythm of the heartbeat. So rhythm will always be safe to us, will always be comforting to us. And that can look as simple as deep breathing, which I know you guys are going to be like, guys, come on, how many deep breathing things can you tell us? <laughs> but seriously, deep breathing is very scientific. And the reason that it's so helpful when you're in the brainstem is because remember I talked about that the brainstem um, oh, uh, controls your auto automatic functions, which is like your blood flow, your heart rate, and your breathing. So the only one that you can control is your breathing. So that's why breathing can be super, super helpful. And deep breaths, right, just look like that. Kind of pausing and then blowing it out. Lots of uh, deep breathing techniques. Um, probably can't practice one today, but there's lots of ones to kind of breathe in, breathe out. So deep breathing is a good one. Just walking, running, singing, dancing, um, swaying, rocking on a rocking chair, humming. Any of those rhythmic activities are going to be helpful when you're in that brainstem. Don't complicate it, guys. Just do something rhythmic and repetitive. And if you're in full-blown kind of terror, know that Okay, you can't just do like two minutes of breathing and you'll be good and calm. Remember, it takes seconds to go down. It takes a while to come back up. So give it time, you know, give it a good 20 minutes of, this, of any regulating activity. Also, a kind of caveat to know is that when you're in that brainstem, the tricky thing is, is that you are not going to have access to this front part. So you can't just say, oh, you know, wait, what did Addy tell me to do when I'm in this part? Like, I need to breathe. Like, you know, that's not going to happen. So the more you can do it outside of afraid, like when you're in a calm and alert, build that routine of bringing rhythm into your life, the more you're going to reach for it when you need it and you're in your brainstem. So it's important to do it outside of being afraid of being when you're in that afraid state as well. It's kind of like we wouldn't throw a kid into the deep end um, and expect them to swim. Same thing. My mentor also says, you know, we can't expect somebody to sink a three-point shot if they've never been practicing three-point shots. Uh, so like a sink three-point shot at the buzzer, never been practicing three-point shots. So important to do the regulation outside of it too. So regulate, regulate, regulate is the main thing that I would send to you guys. Yoga, stretching, any of those things that's rhythmic and repetitive and that doesn't involve language is going to help regulate you. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, can't go too much into relate reason, but once you feel more regulated, which you'll tell from your body, your heart rate's um, down, then you can more relate and then you can more, you know, reason with yourself in that sense. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so me and Caroline were kind of talking about this, and they were actually talking about it a lot in the um, T-Lab, I think that's what it's called, video that Bob was showing earlier, which I had never heard of that organization. It sounds awesome. So I love that you guys have that resource. 
I just wanted to throw this in here because knowing that my mom is an attorney um, and also struggled with this herself, so I can kind of know and not to put you guys all in a box that you all struggle, but I just know that it is a profession where um, you, it's, it's not helpful for you to show your weakness in the courtroom, right? When you're um, dealing with these really intense situations, like that's not helpful for you to show a lot of weakness. So I get that. But when it comes to kind of asking for help and when you're kind of seeing all of those symptoms that I was talking about on that first slide and really, really struggling, uh, there is no weakness when it comes to asking for help. Uh, Brene Brown, who I haven't gotten to talk about a lot today, but hopefully you guys have heard of her. She's amazing, lots of books, TED Talks, I'm trained in her work. You know, she talks a lot about vulnerability and really helping us break down the myths of vulnerability and that vulnerability doesn't equal weakness. And so if you can think about, you know, here recently, maybe the most courageous or bravest thing that you've done lately, which doesn't have to be like, you know, standing in front of the, like pulling kid out of brain building or anything like that, but anything little or small that's been courageous or brave, you know, was there an element of emotional exposure? Was it risky? Was there uncertainty? There, there was, because that's the definition of kind of courage is vulnerability. There is no courage without vulnerability. Anytime you've done anything courageous in your whole entire life, there's been vulnerability, right? Because it wouldn't be courageous if it wasn't vulnerable. It would be just an everyday thing if we, you know, in terms of like courage. So just a little PSA that asking for help does not equal weakness, even though maybe that is what you've been taught or just kind of learned all of those things doesn't mean it. Um, then this other quote that I really, really like is from Elizabeth Gilbert, who's another author that I love and recommend to a lot of my clients. And she just talks about how when you're afraid of surrender because you don't want to lose control, but you never really had control, all you had was anxiety. Um, I think the more we try to like hold on to things and the tighter we do to give us some sense of control, especially right now, we're trying to just control one thing because we can't control everything that's going on. Um, really, when we kind of step back, that's more of our anxiety because we're so, you know, discombobulated with everything that's going on. So asking for help, kind of like surrendering in that sense um, doesn't equal weakness. So just a little PSA that I'm gonna throw out there. And then next, I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, grief because I feel this is really, really important with this pandemic specifically. Um, I'm going to, I think you guys will get a copy of this PowerPoint, but in my resources page, I have a really good article on the pandemic and how it's really a collective grief that we're experiencing. And when I read it, I was like, holy moly, that's exactly what's happening right now, right? Kind of what Caroline was talking about earlier. It, this is grief for sure, right? It's a collective loss of the world that we knew. If we think about um, like 9-11, right? There was airports before 9-11 and airports after 9-11. Same thing now with COVID. It was kind of the world pre-COVID and the world post-COVID. And a lot of things, we will never go back to the world that was pre-COVID. Uh, I know people say, and it's kind of silly, but like blowing candles on a cake, right? We'll probably never do that again because we, we don't want to spread our germs. Um, so the world that we have been accustomed to is gone. And there's a really big heaviness there, right? That's grief. Um, a grief, and I think some people are like, well, no, you know, nobody's died. And some people, I mean, not some people, a lot of people have died. And maybe you have experienced someone who has died of COVID, which then for sure that's a, a death loss grief, right? But outside of that, there's also like death of relationships, death of jobs, um, loss of physical touch, which is huge. Uh, you know, death of like gathering for worship, if that's your thing, or meals, or death of so many, so many things. Um, I know for me, I feel so much grief for my daughter. She's a toddler. She's two and a half. She's almost three. 
Um, and so she has just been with me and my husband, right? She's literally not played with any kids and guys telling you grief and break your heart that she is so wants to play with other kids that whenever we see kids anywhere, you know, she just, she literally stares at them longingly for like minutes and, you know, toddlers have a short attention span. So it breaks my freaking heart, like so bad, a lot of grief there for her, you know, for me, for all the things. So why do I think it's important for it to call it what it is, which is grief? is because of all the emotions, um, Brene Brown talks about this, grief is the emotion that we fear the most. We would prefer to be feel anything but grief, right? And if you've experienced death loss, death loss grief, you know what I'm talking about. We would prefer to feel angry, which we do a lot of times. <laughs> we would prefer to feel numb or um, just pretend that it didn't happen. We would prefer to distract, avoid, and numb than to feel grief. It's just a really, because it's a really kind of depressing emotion, right? It's a strong emotion. Um, it's one that takes some time to work through. And a lot of times we want quick fixes. We don't want that time to work through that painful emotion. So the reason that I just like to name it, that I feel this is an emotion that we are all experiencing at totally different levels, of course, is because, and I'm gonna talk about this in the last slide um, a little bit more, but if we do not name our emotions, then we do not feel it. And what we cannot name, we cannot tame, you know? If we don't even know what we're feeling, we can't work through it at all. And that's when it's just gonna, we're just gonna numb, distract, avoid, and then pretty much it's just gonna, con you know, we still have the feeling, we're just not dealing with it, but really it's dealing with us and how that shows up is all of those symptoms that I showed you guys on the first slide. When we don't really work through our feelings, whether that's with professional help or without, you know, and I'm going to give you a little exercise how to do it without, um, they, they kind of do us. Uh, Brene Brown talks a lot about how we think that we're thinking beings first and then emotional, but we're actually just emotional beings who think sometimes. And so, yeah, if we don't work through these emotions, they kind of do us in a sense. Um, so grief is, in my opinion, what I think we're all kind of experiencing really to kind of just feel gr grief. We have to just kind of feel our feelings. Uh, I think sometimes we want to get out of grief quickly by finding the meaning of this. And I think people are really trying to find the meaning in COVID, which I, I get. And I, I think there will come a time where we will do that. But I think right now it's just working through that, that pain of grief, which is sometimes really the hardest kind of part to kind of work through. Um, if we don't feel it, we won't heal it kind of thing. So we really want to feel it, which definitely sounds counterintuitive. I know. So I might be saying, okay, well, I've never maybe been one who's great about uh, feeling my feelings. Here it is. Oops, sorry guys, whoa. Seems pretty sensitive. So what, how do I feel my feelings? Well, here you go, step by step, how to feel your feelings. Um, and you guys might be thinking, okay, this is like real some woo woo stuff and I get it, but this is all kind of based in research. And again, if we cannot just, guys, we are not robots. Even you as lawyers, I know have feelings, right? We all have feelings. So the more we can just acknowledge them, even though they might be really scary, I promise you that simple practice can give you a lot of relief. Trust me, I have so many clients that come in and um, don't know how to identify their feelings. And I kind of work them through this exercise and encourage them to practice. And it gives them so much relief, just this simple exercise. Um, so feeling your feelings. The first thing we wanna do is we just want to identify your feelings. A really good way to do that is by using an emotions wheel, which I'm gonna show, in, um, there's an emotions wheel on the resource page. You just Look at it, see what emotion you're feeling, identifying it. Then just acknowledging your feelings. So it's okay that I'm feeling grief or that I'm feeling upset or that I'm feeling overwhelmed. That's all. What your mind is gonna wanna do 
is it's going to want to go into the story mode because that's what our mind does. So an example of this is like you have an argument with your husband and then you go into story mode thinking that he doesn't love you anymore because you've gained 20 pounds. Don't do that, right? If we were to truly just let the emotion come and go through our body, it would be gone in 10 seconds. But what stays for long is that story that we attach to it. So we don't want to do that, but it takes a lot of practice to not do that. So if you feel yourself going into story mode, just stop. Don't do that. A good way is just to kind of focus on your body. Again, going back to like the continuum, just focus on how your body is feeling. I'm feeling um, tension in my chest. My throat feels really like it's closing up, right? I have a hard time breathing. Just focusing on your body helps bring you out of your mind and more and just into your body. It helps stick with those feelings, stay out of story mode. Then it's just about doing something regulating. So that's kind of where breathing, moving, dancing, screaming, any of that stuff can really, really help. Uh, and then what I just talked about, you know, just stop thinking your feelings. It's going to want to go into story mode. Just stick with your body, stick with your feelings. That is really going to help you kind of like move through. If you have a really hard time doing this, a lot of research has shown how much or how little we value emotion comes from what we're taught or saw growing up. So just know that it might take a lot of practice because this, this stuff is really learned and modeled. And if we didn't have that, then we're not going to know how to do this stuff, guys. So um, this is just a really simple but very powerful exercise to kind of help you guys work through your feelings. And then the last slide is just the resources page. Just briefly, Brene Brown, I talked about a lot. I didn't go into this book, but I highly recommend it for like burnout. Um, a lot of science stuff by the Nagowski sisters. This is the article that I was talking about, um, the emotions wheel, good stuff on these resources. So that was it. I feel like that was really fast, but let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, I think just will let me know. So and I'm Addie, happy to. Yeah, Addie, yeah. do you have a minute for um, an exercise? Were you gonna direct us through an exercise today or? Yeah, I mean, I can if you guys want to do like a um, like a deep breathing exercise. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, right before you go into that, I just have a couple of comments about some things that you wrote. I mean, that you said in your presentation. I really love the part about the Charlie Brown adult who's going wah, wah, wah. Mm -hmm. And um, if any of us have been in a really emotional situation with a client or opposing counsel, um, and we're standing there and we're thinking, I'm being so reasonable. I don't understand why they don't hear me. And if they're in that state, that more primitive brain state, of course they don't hear you. And that makes so much sense to me now. Um, and I, I think this was really helpful to kind of see the difference, you know, between the wah wah and actually helping them regulate. So I do have a trick actually. I was in a case several years ago and um, there were several contentious people that I had to deal with on a regular basis. And I had, I developed a little trick to help um, get through the conversations. And I realize now it's very related to that regulate R that Addie talked about. So before the call, I would prepare myself mentally and physically. I would get really calm. So I would do the tricks that I know to do, which is the deep breathing, um, having my notes in front of me and the points that I know I want to hit. And when I would get on the call and I would feel that person's energy coming at me and they're really hyped up, I would react by just like getting like a turtle. Like I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to bring my head in. I'm not going to jump into it with them. And I would slow them down by slowing myself down. So I would force the whole conversation to slow down by doing my own breathing through the call and also by deepening my voice and just slowing everything down. And it worked so well with almost everybody I've used it on. So it's that whole idea of getting back into a rhythm and just getting it out of this like type of frenetic energy and into a much more uh, relaxed energy. Um, yeah, and then just quickly, yes, because the best way that we can help regulate others is by staying regulated ourselves. Um, because we, there's like this thing called neuro, neuro, neurons. And so when we, and you guys could even practice it with your kids, like 
when you stop and kind of take a deep breath, they may also stop and take a deep breath too, right? And when, yeah, you slow down your voice, that's awesome, Carolyn, you did it intuitively because that's exactly what um, we kind of do as therapists. Um, sometimes we invite the client, but a lot of times we can just model that and it be powerful. Yeah, I really like that. And then another thing I really related to in your talk um, had to do with burying your feelings and being much more in your head than in your body. Um, I'm an Episcopalian. I grew up in my family learning how to mask emotions. And I think for me, it had to do with control. Like I want to be in control of my emotions. I don't want to give away my secrets by letting them know how I'm feeling. And I carry that with me to this day, but what happens is I mask it from myself too. So right. something will happen to me on day one and I won't feel angry until day two or day three. And then I'm a raging lunatic because like it's taken days to catch up with me. And it, it's really, I've made it very difficult for me to identify what I'm feeling when I'm feeling it and then actually reacting because I've trained myself otherwise. And I've noticed um, one of the positives out of COVID has been how much time I've been spending outside and how much time I've been spending exercising um, because I feel so much better. And it goes back to that regulation, right? If we get into a rhythm of walking or swimming or um, just a rhythm that is outside of our, like getting us out of here and back into our bodies, it can be a great way to cope with stress and to get us back to that calm state instead of being in the fear and the, um, what was the other state? I can't remember, but um, the it's afraid. Afraid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I thought that was really helpful. Um, and uh, one other quick thing I've noticed, um, if you've ever had a client that's an adult survivor of childhood trauma, um, I tend to have a lot of them for some reason. <laughs> um, we'll talk about an issue several times you know, and I'm thinking they're getting it. And we have to have the same conversation a month later and a month later and a month later. And it goes all back to that. What state are you in and where can you reason and accept information? Are you in the alert and the reasoning state? Or are you down here in this, I'm reliving childhood trauma from 20 years ago all the time. And um, I think if we understand that about our clients, we don't get so frustrated with, we just had this conversation last week or last mm -hmm. month. I put, a, I put a memo together. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? And this is helping me understand, maybe I just need to repeat it a few times. Maybe they're just not in the state where they can even understand what's going on. So, but yeah, definitely. You so much. yeah thank you so yeah. much Dave, for your calls. Um, I don't see any questions either. Um, do you have possibly um, a five minute or three minute deep breathing you want to do? If not, yeah, 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 I can, we can do that. Um, so we can, I'll just walk you through uh, a progressive muscle relaxation. This is one of my favorites that I really like to do. And the reason is that going back to like the brain and everything, when we're in that afraid state and our body is kind of taking over, we uh, tend to really tense our muscles. So you might have experienced this where, excuse me, you've gone through something and then you come home and you feel like you're in a marathon, but you really didn't do anything, but your muscles just feel so darn tight. Uh, that's because when we're in that afraid state, our, we tense our muscles naturally, right? Because we're getting prepared to fight or flight this thing that probably not there, but that's what our mind feels like. So our muscles feel really, really tense. So this is a really good one to do at the end of the day, specifically before you go to sleep. PMR really helps uh, you do that. And you can do it just by doing it um, to yourself or just search YouTube progressive muscle relaxation in my resources. I have a really good one that you can do as well. So I just want you guys to kind of sit um, in a comfortable position. And if you want to shut your eyes, you can do so if you feel comfortable. And then let's just begin by taking a really uh, big deep breath in. And kind of noticing the feeling of air filling your lungs and hold it for a few seconds and then release the breath slowly. 
and just feel that tension kind of leaving your body. And take in another really deep breath and hold it. And again, slowly release the air. And now I just want you guys to move your attention to your feet and just begin to tense your feet by gently curling your toes and the arch of your foot. And just hold on to that tension and notice what it feels like. And now just release that tension in your foot. Just noticing the new feeling of relaxation. And now I just want you guys to move up to your lower leg. And I just want you to tense the muscles in your calves. Hold them tightly and pay attention to the feeling of tension. And then releasing that tension from your lower legs. Again, just noticing the feeling of relaxation. Just remembering to continue to take those deep breaths. Then I just want you to tense the muscles of your upper leg and pelvis. You can do this by tightly squeezing your thighs together. Make sure that you guys feel the tenseness without going to the point of strain. And then release. Just feeling that tension leave your muscles. And now begin to tense your stomach and your chest. And you can just do this by sucking your stomach in, so pulling your belly button all the way in kind of squeezing harder, just to hold that tension just a little bit longer. And now just release the tension, just allowing your body to go limp and let yourself notice that feeling of relaxation. Just continue taking those big, big deep breaths. Notice yourself breathing in slowly, hold it, and then breathing out. And now just tense the muscles in your back, bringing your shoulders a bit behind you. Your hands are like this, and just hold them tightly. You can send as hard as you can, but without straining, keep holding. You really, really want to feel that tension in your body. And now release the tension from your back. Just feeling that tension, just slowly leaving your body. And the new feeling of relaxation kind of setting in. Just notice how different your body feels when you allow it to relax. Then I just want you to tense your arms all the way up from your hands to your shoulders. You can make a fist and squeeze all the way up your arm and hold it. And then release the tension from your arms and shoulders. Just notice the feeling of relaxation in your fingers, your hands, your arms, your shoulders. Notice how your arms just feel really limp and at ease. Now I want you to move up to your neck and head. We hold a lot of tension in our face. So I want you to tense your face and your neck by distorting the muscles around your eyes and mouth. Just doing like this. Don't worry, nobody sees you. Just hold the tension. And just release and kind of release you're uh, releasing the tension feeling that new feeling of relaxation and then finally i just want you guys to tense your entire body so your feet your legs your stomach chest arms head and neck just 
tends a little bit harder without straining. Hold the tension. And now release. Just kind of fully feeling your whole body go limp. Pay attention to the feeling of relaxation and how different it is from the feeling of tension. And when you're ready, just slowly begin to wake your body up by slowly moving your muscles, just adjusting your arms and legs, and open your eyes when you feel ready. Uh, that's just an example of PMR. There's tons of progressive muscle relaxation stuff out there. So you can do it on your own or just listen to a video. All right, thank you, Addy. Thank you, guys. Appreciate y'all. Thank you both ladies, both Caroline and Addy. We very much appreciate your contributions today and as a final reminder, the CLE course number for the live broadcast will be provided to you via email to the address you provided at registration. You will likely see that email in the next few hours or less. If you do not receive that required information to self-report your participation in the CLE, please email me directly, trafficloyersoftexasonline at gmail.com, no abbreviations. If you are participating in the CLE on demand, as a reminder, you will receive instructions via email to the address you provided on at registration for self-reporting and uh, at the, with the online uh, on-demand CLE course number upon completion of the online on-demand option. We appreciate all of our panelists today. We want to give a very uh, heartfelt thank you to Kelly McMahon for facilitating and also Cynthia Owens and all of the board members that made this broadcast possible. We very much appreciate all of the effort that went into making this such a success today. And we look forward to seeing everyone in January, 2021 in Austin at our live CLE. Thank you very much. <laughs>